Yeah, let's give the Lord a big hand tonight. Thank you, worship team. Go ahead and give somebody an air fist bump, air high five, have a seat if you will. Grab your bulletins, I wanna highlight some really good stuff going on around here. It's good to have you, we're glad you're here. Those of you joining online, glad you're tracking with us as well. We have an incredible weekend this weekend. We're gonna talk more about it here in just a little bit. We're having what we call, we do this a couple times a year, it's called a conference weekend. But we're having a guest and we, we have three unique services this weekend. Dr. Hugh Ross from uh, Reasons to Believe Ministries, been here with us many times. He's a theologian, he's an astrophysicist. He's gonna be joining us this weekend. But before we get there, if you will, pull out your bulletin, highlight a couple things. This is typically the time that we take up our offering, but we're not doing that where we're passing the buckets. What we're doing now is for your tithes and your offerings. Uh, if, you, you know, if you have a check or cash, something like that, on your way out at the exits, you can see the receptacles throughout the building at all the exits, you'll see them as well. You can put in your offering or your tithe that way. Of course, many of you are giving online and, and you can continue to do that. We wanna encourage those as well. Maybe if you're a first time visitor with us or, or online as well, there's some ways to connect with us and we don't want you to miss this opportunity. There's a, a connect card here in the seats and, and up in the pews as well. Online, you can see how you can connect with us with a number to text. But we wanna pray for you. And, and our, our team is eager to connect with you and pray for you. You can put a prayer request on there. And we have lots of our pastors and leaders that are, are making phone calls as well and calling people, encouraging you and praying for you. And if that's something that you'd like to do, you can put your phone number. Now, some people are like, I ain't put my phone number on a piece of paper. We'll call the church office. You can call the church office anytime you want. You can leave your number with the receptionist and one of our leaders, our pastors, will reach back out and pray and, uh, and, and encourage you. And we, wanna, we really wanna encourage you not to miss that opportunity. A couple things I, I wanna highlight here. There's, first off, a lot of really good stuff happening and I want you to be aware of But Number one, just a back to school, our students. Look at these things here. These are some things where we're finally getting our kids and our students beginning to come back on campus. You can see the back to school next Sunday. We're having a big family service in the gym during the 11 a.m. If you have kids, look at the details. You don't want to miss it. Students, middle school, high school, we're beginning to do lots of stuff here on campus as well. You don't want to miss that during our Sunday 11 a.m. service with small groups, our Wednesday nights, all the details are there. And then I want some dads that have of kids, you know, boys are 12 and up. Look at this Sunrise Legacy Weekend. You know, Owen's uh, 12 this year and, and I'm gonna be doing this and several of my friends are gonna be going. And I wanna encourage you dads, don't miss this. This is an information meeting that we're having Monday and then towards the end of the month, a weekend where Pastor Bob Pickett's been doing this for years and some men around here, we're gonna have a weekend where we really can connect with our, our young sons and, and speak life into them. And it's gonna be an incredible time. You can see the details right there on the Sunrise uh, Legacy Weekend. Well, we have a, a, an incredible, well, one more thing, one more thing, I just thought about it. My shirt, check this out, really cool shirt. We've got lots of really cool merchandise. You can see it online. This weekend, we're having a discount. There's a, a discount on cups and mugs and hats and shirts. Well, we're representing our church family well. We love Grace Church, but you can see that there in the bulletin. And online, you can see that as well. I had to give a pitch for that because this is a really cool shirt. It fits great. Okay. All right. We have um, Dr. Hugh Ross. So here's what the, the service is going to look like. A little different this weekend. Dr. Ross is going to be, he's, he's actually going to be piping in. We're going to have him live with us tonight. He's going to be teaching us there from his, uh, his, his office in Los Angeles. And then we're going to have a time of Q&A with him. Now, this guy's an astrophysicist and a theologian, really, really smart on lots of, of, of different issues. So what we're going to do is as he's teaching tonight, you're going to see a number up here, and you can see it online as well. And you, if you have a question about something he says, and you're like, wait a second, you've got to break that down more, text in your questions. He's going to teach for about a half hour, and then Ron and I are going to come out, and we're going to continue to kind of interview him and drill him with questions, some of our own questions that our staff has, some of the questions that you text right in tonight during the service. So please take us up on that. And of course, Hugh will be talking about if your questions don't get answered, how you can interact with him and his team to get your questions answered. 
It's going to be a great time. Okay, let's pray, and then we're going to welcome Dr. Hiras and get right to it. Father, we come before you tonight. Lord, a grateful people. We thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for Reasons to Believe Ministry and Dr. Hugh Ross and the, the gift that he's been to us here at Grace Church. Lord, we, we ask you tonight that you would challenge us, that you would encourage us, inspire a, an appreciation and love for the Bible, because that's what he does so well. God, we love and we bless you. And we also thank you, Lord, for your provision. We don't overlook it. You've, you continue to meet our needs. We thank you for that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Can we give a big St. Louis Grace Church welcome for Dr. Hugh Ross once again? Come on, guys. Let's welcome Dr. Ross. Well, thank you for inviting me to join you through this amazing 21st technology that uh, we call Zoom. Uh, it's not the same as being there in person with you. And I'd love to be able to see you out there in the audience. It really does energize me when I give the talk. So if I look a little flat, uh, you, you know why. Uh, but uh, this, is, this is a treat. And again, I look forward to being with you in person uh, when this pandemic allows that to happen. Uh, and uh, we are going to be taking questions. So if you've got questions, uh, we'll have a time to do that. Uh, but what I'm going to do right now uh, so is actually uh, share the screen so you can actually see my slides uh, as we go through this talk. Uh, so let me get that set up for you right now. Okay, you should all be seeing my first slide here. And uh, this slide just simply indicates if you don't get to ask your question today, uh, I do take questions on Facebook and Twitter. And at least so far, I think I've been able to keep up with all the questions. And if you're not aware of this, Reasons to Believe as a 24-7 YouTube channel. And you can subscribe for free. We're putting up videos there almost on a daily basis. If you've got any questions or you want to see our blogs, you can do that at reasons.org. And uh, I have a chapter on the faint sun paradox in this book, Improbable Planet. And uh, you can get that chapter free at uh, reasons.org slash Ross. Matter of fact, you can get free chapters of all my books there at uh, reasons.org slash Ross, and feel free to share that uh, with other people. Uh, but I'm also gonna be sharing some things that are not in the book, Improbable Planet, with you uh, today. And uh, also, either uh, you'll find uh, material in my latest book, Weathering Climate Change, uh, and we'll cover some of that, but there's a lot in Weathering Climate Change I'm not gonna be able to get to today. And again, you can get a free chapter at the reasons.org uh, slash Ross. Uh, so the talk is uh, why uh, the faint sun paradox. And I need to set up my second computer here. So give me a chance to do that. I wound up setting up uh, two different talks, but uh, let's go for this. Thank you for being patient with me here. Okay, here we go. Faint sun paradox new evidence for creation. And I've really put together this talk as, as I engage evolutionary biologists. And what I've noticed with my friends who are evolutionary biologists is they really don't take into account the changing physics of the sun when they try to build their models for the history of life on earth. And therefore they fail to see uh, the powerful scientific evidence uh, for miraculous intervention on the part of God uh, for the history of life on planet Earth and for the purposes of the history uh, that we see in the fossil record. Naturalistic models for life's origins and history typically only consider the life sciences data. And we shouldn't be surprised, scientists just by their very nature have to specialize. That was the way it was with me when I was at Caltech. I only had time to read the scientific literature in my narrow subdiscipline, and therefore was not able to consider uh, what other disciplines had a role. And likewise, life sciences typically fail to consider the role of the changing physics of the sun, earth, and moon uh, when they build uh, their models. And so that's what we're gonna look at today. Scientific models that provably lack explanatory scope or explanatory power are judged to be failed models. And this is kind of what I'm gonna be demonstrating today is how when we actually look across all the scientific disciplines, 
uh, then it becomes clear that certain evolutionary models uh, indeed need not just major adjustments, they need to be uh, replaced with models that are capable of explaining life's history across all the scientific disciplines, uh, not just say uh, the discipline of uh, genetics. Now, when we look at the sun, what we notice is that the sun's flaring activity changes dramatically over its history. I often joke with people that are not astronomers that stars are like human beings. They're unstable when they're young, they're unstable when they're old, they're reasonably stable when they're middle age. Uh, but in the case of we humans, we're stable for most of our life. That's not the case with stars. Stars are only stable and in a very narrow time window when the star is almost exactly middle age. Now of all the stars that exist, it's stars that are exactly the mass of our star, the sun, that have the least flaring activity uh, over their lifespan. Uh, but what this chart actually shows you uh, is the solar flare activity uh, over the nine billion year uh, hydrogen burning uh, period uh, of the sun. That little dotted line there indicates uh, where we are right now. And uh, what you see on the uh, y-axis there is solar flare activity. And uh, this is not a linear scale, it's logarithmic. And what I mean by logarithmic, if you go back to when this sun was just forming, its flaring activity was hundreds of thousands of times uh, more intense than it is today. So what you need to realize, it actually shrinks by several hundred thousand uh, from its greatest flaring activity to where it is now at the minimum. And so at 4.57 billion years is when the sun's flaring activity, it's at its minimal state and actually explains a little bit why life history looks the way it does because microbes can handle a lot of flaring activity. We human beings cannot, and especially on global civilization, it requires a flaring activity uh, be at an extreme uh, minimal level. And you notice here in the future, it's gonna pick up again and become thousands and tens of thousands of times more intense. And the solar flaring activity also correlates uh, with its ultraviolet radiation and X-ray radiation. And clearly, if you wanna advance life on planet Earth, you need to also minimize the ultraviolet and X-ray uh, radiation. But this is what we've learned over the past few years in studying the physics of the sun, is that the flaring activity becomes minimal when the sun is 4.57 billion years old, and that the sun uh, goes through a period of extreme luminosity stability. And that a period of extreme luminosity stability only lasts a little less than 100,000 years. And guess where we are right now? We're halfway through that 100,000 year period of extreme solar luminosity stability. And recently I published a blog that you can see at reasons.org where I actually showed you uh, the luminosity stability of the sun compared to the most sun-like stars we see in our galaxy. And what you see is that the sun is at least five times more stable in its luminosity stability. We're literally orbiting by far the most stable star in our entire Milky Way galaxy of 400 billion stars. And then this next slide shows you the change in the sun's brightness with respect to time. This is significant because virtually every evolutionary biologist has engaged has made the mistake of assuming that the sun's brightness does not change uh, over its history. This chart shows you it changes dramatically and the, the physics makes this clear. As the sun fuses hydrogen into helium, uh, the conversion of hydrogen into helium, the core of the sun, actually increases the density in the core of the sun and that increased density causes the nuclear furnace in the center of our sun to burn progressively more efficiently. And so the, the moment that hydrogen fusion gets ignited in the core of the sun, which happens when it's about a half a billion years old, from that time onward, the sun gets brighter and brighter as it gets older and older, where today it's about 23% brighter than when life first appeared on planet Earth uh, 3.8 billion years ago. And this poses a problem for evolutionary models in this context. For example, if we were to 
drop the luminosity of the sun just by 2%, keep in mind it's changed by 23% over the history of life, that would cause a runaway glaciation. Why? Because if the sun becomes less luminous, uh, that means the temperature in the surface of the earth drops, which causes more snow to fall compared to rain, and snow reflects sunlight with high efficiency, about 60% efficiency. And so it cools the whole planet. When you cool the planet, more snow falls, that reflects more sunlight. And in a short period of time, the entire planet is completely covered with ice and uh, life gets permanently exterminated on the face of the earth. You get a similar problem if the sun were to become brighter. Uh, brighten up the sun by 4%, uh, this would cause the temperature in the surface of the earth to rise, which causes more water vapor to be evaporated. And water vapor is a powerful greenhouse gas that traps more solar heat, which causes more water to be evaporated, which traps more heat. And very quickly, all the ice and liquid water in the face of the earth gets converted into steam and the planet becomes a permanently in uninhabitable. Now you're talking advanced life. This 2% and 4% gets considerably reduced. Even changing the luminosity of the sun by a few tenths of a percent is enough to rule out the possibility of advanced life uh, on uh, planet Earth. So just again to review here, we see a 23% change in the luminosity of the sun uh, throughout its history, uh, which raises what's called the faint sun paradox. The faint sun paradox is the paradox of trying to explain why life has been so abundant on our planet for the past 3.8 billion years, given that the sun is getting brighter and brighter by this rather large degree over its history. What compensates for the brightening of the sun? Well, I devote quite a bit to this in my book, Improbable Planet. I talk about 15 different features uh, of the, or factors that actually help compensate uh, for the brightening of the sun. Basically making the point, as the sun gets brighter and brighter, different factors are in operation, uh, which cause the atmosphere of our planet to trap less and less heat uh, as uh, the planet uh, gets older and older. And so as the sun is getting brighter and brighter, our atmosphere is progressively trapping less and less heat from the sun. And this has been in perfect balance for the past 3.8 billion years. So these are the physical compensating factors that physicists and astronomers have been looking at uh, over uh, the past couple of decades. Uh, I'm not gonna go into this in any detail. Those of you who are interested in the technical details uh, will find all of this uh, described in some uh, depth. Uh, with citations of the scientific literature. And incidentally, what we now do in our books, we give you direct links to those papers so you can see for yourselves uh, what the original authors were saying about this. But what I really wanna focus on, given that my time is limited, that what astronomers and physicists and geophysicists have overlooked is the role that light plays. That's the point I'm making. Life scientists and physical scientists need to talk to one another. And when they talk to one another, they're gonna see the handiwork of God. And so those 15 factors are the physical things that can operate to compensate for the brightening of the sun, but by themselves are not adequate uh, to actually uh, bring down the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere to a sufficient level. The only way it can be done at a sufficient rate to perfectly compensate for the sun's luminosity is to have just the right life on planet Earth at just the right time and just the right diversity and just the right abundance uh, because what this life on planet Earth is actually regulate these 15 physical factors in such a way as to bring about a perfect compensation. And so we'll spend the rest of our time uh, looking at that the very point. And the biggest factor of all that compensates uh, for the brightening of the sun is something called the carbonate silicate cycle. Now, my wife tells me that whenever I speak in a church, I should never ever uh, put equations on a slide. Uh, but for those of you who remember your high school chemistry, 
I just thought this was just too good not to show you. And uh, for those of you who've forgotten your high school chemistry, uh, just go down to that bottom line there. Uh, but when you look at the continents on the face of the earth, these continents are made up of silicates. Silicate is silicon with three oxygen atoms attached to it. And uh, then you've got uh, our continents are basically metal ions that are attached to silicate. Uh, but what this is showing you is that if you've got falling rain, what you see in the top two equations is that rain falling from the sky acts as a catalyst. And this catalyst drives this reaction such that the silicates that make up uh, the crust of the earth, uh, when they're above the ocean, when they're exposed to the air, uh, falling rain acts as a catalyst to drive a chemical reaction whereby the silicates combine with atmospheric carbon dioxide uh, to make carbonates and sand. Silicon dioxide is sand, that calcium carbonate is there. And this reaction is the same whether it's for sodium or calcium or iron or any other metal. Uh, but what you notice here is this reaction runs, carbon dioxide, a powerful greenhouse gas, is pulled out of the atmosphere. And if you go back to the origin of life on planet Earth, uh, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was just under 100,000 parts per million, a lot more carbon dioxide than we see today, and where today we're at just 400 uh, parts per million. And so this reaction has been running throughout the history of life on planet Earth, pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. But there's also another big benefit. These silicates are really not very useful industrial materials. Uh, they don't really have any value uh, for the projects that we human beings are interested in. Uh, but carbonates and sand uh, which are the end products of this reaction are extremely valuable. Carbonates and sand uh, are the primary ingredients for concrete. Uh, so we're able to use uh, these carbonates uh, and the sand uh, to make freeways, skyscrapers, and uh, lots of other uh, structures are possible. Matter of fact, I think what's interesting is that we're exploiting carbonates at such a great rate today uh, that there's actually a sand shortage in the world. Uh, well, not really, there's a lot of sand, but easy to mine sand uh, is difficult. And uh, we here in California have actually been trying to protect our beaches from people who would like to just take all the sand out and use it to make uh, skyscrapers and freeways and other structures throughout the world. But what is interesting is that life regulates the degree to which this reaction runs. And so certain life forms will cause this reaction to run more rapidly than other life forms. And when you look at the fossil record, we see that there's been a creator bringing life upon planet Earth at just the right times so that the new life replaces the old life, but the new life actually is able to make this reaction run faster. And you say, by to what degree? Sometimes as much as four times faster. Uh, than the other life forms. And so here you see a slide of a bacterial mat. Bacterial mats uh, do uh, uh, operate this uh, silicate cycle, but at a very low rate. So it explains why we had these, uh, uh, one reason why we had these bacterial mats is we didn't want this reaction to run rapidly uh, when uh, we had a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because the sun was a lot dimmer than it was today. You didn't want it running at a fast rate. Uh, but as you look at the fossil record, we see there's a time when these bacterial mats are replaced by cryptogamic crusts. Uh, and uh, so these are uh, primitive uh, symbiotic uh, colonies of algae and fungi and bacteria that carpeted the continental land masses uh, billions of years ago. Uh, you can still find these uh, cryptogamic soils in high alpine environments. So I took this uh, photograph, for example, uh, in central British Columbia at a high mountain altitude uh, where you had the, the still operating. And, uh, and so this actually runs the reaction more efficiently uh, than what you would get with the bacterial mats. And uh, then about 400 million years ago, we get uh, plants showing up and uh, we have these ferns 
and they're able to make this reaction run uh, about 60% uh, faster than any microbial life. And then it gets replaced by trees. And uh, you know, here we see pine trees uh, growing on solid granite. Uh, this is a photo I took on the high Sierras. And so here you got this solid granite mountain cathedral peak. And what we see is growing even on the high levels of this granite peak, you see conifers. And the conifers uh, are able to grow in places where no other life form is able to grow. And they, they, they come out with these roots and these roots go into the little tiny cracks in the granite. They basically buy, these roots are very strong and they expand the cracks. And when they expand the cracks, that allows more rain falling from the sky to expose a greater area of the silicates here, which allows this reaction to run as much as four times more rapidly than you would get uh, with bacterial life. And so, and again, you can see all the sand that's being produced at the bottom here as a result of this kind of uh, growth that is taking place. Let me catch up my other computer here. Okay, and now I want to address life's second biggest compensating factor. Uh, life uh, drives the carbonate or the carbonate silicate cycle, and this is responsible for 80% of the greenhouse gases that are being pulled out of the atmosphere today. In the past, it wasn't as efficient as it is today, but today uh, it's responsible for 80% of the greenhouse gas removal. 20% uh, is the result of the burial of organic carbon. And so one reason why plant life and forests are so prolific on planet Earth is that uh, these forests and the uh, grasslands uh, and the dense vegetation you see there, uh, what you see is that these uh, plants grow, these trees grow, and then they die. And when they die, you get the decay products, which is basically a whole bunch of uh, carbon molecular material. And uh, if you get a flood, or if you get uh, a volcanic eruption, or some kind of tectonic event, uh, what can happen is that this stuff that uh, forms these uh, dead uh, vegetation, uh, black mats, winds up getting buried. And when it gets buried, that pulls uh, greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. So instead of this dead vegetation decaying and releasing the carbon that it consumed from the atmosphere back to the atmosphere, it gets buried and therefore uh, that carbon does not get released back to the atmosphere. Incidentally, there's another benefit. When it gets buried like that, it gets converted to coal and natural gas and uh, uh, you know, oil uh, that we can mine and use to sustain our civilization. So the efficient silicate erosion and organic carbon burial, however, both require enduring aggressive uh, plate tectonic activity. If you don't have long lasting plate tectonic activity, uh, both of these reactions are gonna have a problem. Why? It takes plate tectonic activity to transform our planet from a water world, like you see described in Genesis 1-2, where there's only water all over the surface of the earth uh, to where uh, you have the plate tectonics basically converting uh, the basalt layers at the bottom of the oceans into silicates, the silicates being lighter float above the basalts. And if you wait long enough, uh, that results in the continents showing up above the surface of the uh, uh, waters. And so we notice on creation day three in Genesis one, is when we actually see God transforming our planet from a water world to where we got oceans and continents coexisting. And you need these continental land masses to get the silicate reaction running, because unless you've got rain falling on exposed silicates, uh, you're not going to get uh, that silicate reaction running. But without the plate tectonics, that's not going to happen. You need the plate tectonics to be sustained, uh, because if it's not sustained, uh, then erosion will wear down the continents and you're back to a water world. But what's happening, the erosion forces are wearing down the continents at almost the same rate uh, that the te plate tectonics is building up continents. And uh, the plate tectonics is actually building up continents at a very slightly greater rate than the erosion forces are wearing them down. 
So for example, we got those tectonic activities uh, actually working uh, to make the state of Hawaii bigger uh, than it was in the past, because there the tectonic activity is quite a bit greater uh, than the erosion forces. But to get long lasting plate tectonics, uh, you also need to have a photosynthetic life. This is a big feature that's been overlooked in evolutionary biology is that plate tectonics requires photosynthetic life in order to be sustained at a powerful level for a long period of time. Why? Because photosynthetic life uh, generates a reaction uh, that precipitates uranium. And as this photosynthetic life dies, and the erosion forces uh, bring that uh, photosynthetic dead life uh, into the oceans and into the subduction zones where you've got two plates coming close to one another. It's bringing uh, these uranium precipitates uh, between these tectonic plates and those uranium precipitates provide the energy that drives a chemical reaction that makes telt, which allows these plates to slide under one another. And uh, so in order to keep the plate tectonic activity running as efficiently it does, you need photosynthetic life, uh, but it's a synergy. If you want life to be sustained on planet Earth for a long time, you need the plate tectonics uh, running, but to keep the plate tectonics running, you also need life. And it's no accident that the origin of life happens at the same time we see plate tectonic activity uh, being ignited. And this is what you have to do uh, to have the plate tectonics running. Incidentally, there's about 30 different features that must be fine tuned to have long lasting efficient plate tectonics so that you can have long lasting life on planet Earth. Here I'm just showing four of these. Number one, you need abundant dense liquid water at the boundaries between the tectonic plates. Uh, we actually refer to this as class six liquid water. Uh, you may not be aware of this, uh, but liquid water comes in different forms and we need the densest form to be there at the plate boundaries. And that's the way it is here on our planet Earth. You need photosynthetic life close enough to the subduction zones that we can get these uranium precipitates there to provide the necessary heat. Uh, you need powerful enduring radioactivity. Uh, so we need a lot of uranium and thorium potassium in the interior of the earth uh, to actually drive the reactions in the mantle that can sustain uh, these uh, the plates, the plate movements. And you need a powerful enduring uh, electric dynamo in earth's interior. Uh, that's also a factor in maintaining the tectonics, but we also get the blessing that that enduring dynamo sets up a powerful magnetic shield around our planet. And that powerful uh, magnetic shield shields us from deadly solar radiation, as well as a deadly uh, cosmic uh, radiation. But just to, to summarize here, uh, the, how life compensates for the sun getting brighter and brighter is that number one, it erodes the silicates, which pulls carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and blesses us with a lot of sand and carbonates. Uh, you have to have the burial of organic carbon, uh, which is responsible for pulling one fifth of the greenhouse gases of the atmosphere currently. And that also has the added blessing of providing us with abundant fossil fuels. And number three, uh, life can compensate by changing the atmospheric chemistry and the cloud cover. Different kinds of life uh, will release chemicals to the atmosphere in such a way that it changes uh, the cloud cover, uh, which can affect how much sunlight is reflected away from the earth. And reflecting away more sunlight is another way to cool the planet uh, as it gets uh, warmer and warmer. So life plays a role there. And actually life plays a direct role in changing uh, Earth's uh, reflectivity in the sense that some plants uh, have bright reflective surfaces and therefore if you got a lot of that vegetation in the face of the earth, that's gonna efficiently reflect sunlight away. Uh, whereas other vegetation is very dark, uh, like those cryptogamic soils I showed you uh, are very dark and therefore don't reflect sunlight very efficiently at all. And that's what you want uh, life to be predominantly made up of uh, when uh, the earth is relatively young 
and have more reflective life uh, when the planet is a little bit uh, older. But here's the bottom line. It takes someone with a mind who knows the future physics of the sun, the earth and the moon. I haven't covered the changing physics of the earth and the moon. I haven't got time to do that, but I dealt with that in Improbable Planet. Here I'm just focusing the sun it takes someone with the intelligence and the knowledge that knows the future physics of the sun to know which life to remove from planet Earth and which new life to replace that life uh, with its more efficient of uh, pulling greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere at just the right rate. And we're looking at some mindless evolutionary process. It's quickly going to get out of sync with the changing physics of the sun, and you're going to wind up with a planet uh, that's permanently uninhabitable. And you actually see this explicitly stated uh, in a verse that you see in Psalm 104. Psalm 104 is the most extensive of the creation psalms. There are several in the book of Psalms. This is the longest and most detailed. Uh, towards the end, verses 29 and 30, we've got this statement referring to life. They die and return to the dust. When you send your spirit, they are created and renew the face of the earth. And this is an enigma that has struck evolutionary biologists. When you look at the details of the fossil record, we see that about every 30 to 35 million years, life on planet earth suffers a mass extinction event where 25 to 50%, sometimes 95% of the species of life uh, are driven to extinction. We now know why things like asteroid collisions, widespread volcanic eruptions, comet collision events uh, will occur at such a rate that it actually can remove wholesale uh, a lot of life from planet Earth. But we notice is every mass extinction event we see in the fossil record is quickly followed up by a mass speciation event uh, where thousands to millions of new species all show up. And when they show up, they all show up quickly uh, to replace the life that's gone extinct. And when they show up, they show up with optimized ecological relationships already in place. What I mean by that is that the relationships between the carnivores, the herbivores, uh, the parasites, and the detritivores are optimized for the benefit of all kinds of life. From an evolutionary perspective, without an intelligent mind uh, engineering everything, uh, you would expect that it would take tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of years uh, for any possible optimization of these relationships, but consistently they're optimized uh, right away. And moreover, we astronomers have calculated based on the physics of the sun, how often you want this to happen. You want this to happen about once every 33 million years. And actually that's the rate at which it does happen. So the crater there, knowing the physics of the sun, removes life that's not that efficient in pulling greenhouse gases of the atmosphere and replaces it with new life that is more efficient at pulling greenhouse gases of the atmosphere. So as the sun gets brighter and brighter, uh, we have the temperature in the surface of the earth remaining optimal for life so that we can have the earth packed with as much life as possible as diverse as possible and as long as possible. And if you read the whole of Psalm 104, that's what it's really talking about, how our creator has packed our planet with as much life as possible and as diverse as possible so that in spite of the changing physics of the sun, uh, we have this abundance of life on planet Earth. And in closing, we've got this one passage we see in Psalm 104, verse 24, how many are your works, O Lord? In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Uh, there are many more passages like this. I'm just going to share one more. And uh, that is, which we see in Isaiah 45, 18, speaking of God, he did not create it, namely the earth to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. And something else that we see in the fossil record is as we go from 3.8 billion years ago, right up to the present, we see that our planet has an increasing abundance of life and increasing diversity. So when God created Adam and Eve, uh, our planet had the theoretical maximum greatest diversity of life on planet Earth. Again, the signature 
of a supernatural, super intelligent creator packing the planet with as much life uh, so that we humans can enable to have billions of people living on the planet at one time, taking advantage of the live life and taking advantage also of the quadrillions of tons of bio deposits in the crust of the earth laid down by previous generations of life so that billions of us can hear the gospel message and uh, have an opportunity uh, to be redeemed from our sin and evil and be prepared to enter into the new creation. Again, if you want to read more about this, uh, you can check out my book, Improbable Planet, a uh, free chapter at uh, reasons.org. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> This is where it gets dangerous <laughs> when we get to actually start asking you questions. But these questions are sure not gonna sound that good. Uh, we are so glad to have you with us, man. Thank you for this. So you're hearing me? Oh yeah, I can hear you. Oh good, good, here we go. Uh, man, I don't even know where to start. Uh, we, so so here's, the, here's the big question. I'm trying not to sound like a smart aleck. Uh, so the Green New Deal people say we've only got 12 years left before our cities flood. I mean, I, let's just get that one out of the way right, right, across, right at the get-go. Uh, how, how accurate are these predictions that we're in dire straits right now and that this is just, everything's falling apart? And... Well, I'm gonna be addressing that tomorrow morning, so uh, they can wait for that. But, okay, okay. Uh, the sea levels are rising like a fraction of a millimeter per year. So yes, uh, if the climate keeps warming, uh, the sea levels will rise uh, by about uh, 10 meters, but we're looking at centuries for that to happen. Okay. Good news. All right, we're all <laughs> gonna be all right. <laughs> we're all gonna die on dry land. That's good news. <laughs> uh, you know, we, I, I actually started, Ron Krauss and I, who, who is our tech director and I, years ago, this is probably 25 years or more ago, started listening to you on cassette tapes. We had a, a lawyer friend who had a lot of your stuff and uh, man, you rocked my world because I had grown up believing that, you know, you had to close your eyes to science to believe the Bible. And you actually came to faith trying to disprove the Bible <laughs> scientifically and uh, everything you saw, you know, just caused you to believe, hence the name Reasons to Believe. And your organization actually, to th this day, I mean, all the recent scientific discoveries you guys put out as proof of scripture. So, Go into just a little bit of your story, because you were, you were a real young guy when you started to try to dismantle world religions, and how, how many world religions did you get to before Christianity, and how did that happen? Well, I purposely left Christianity to the end, because I knew it would be the most challenging one to put to any kind of rigorous uh, scientific tests. And it was my years of studying astronomy from the age of seven that by age 16 convinced me there had to be a God. And I first tried to find that God in the writings of the great philosophers. That was kind of disappointing. And then I began to go through the different holy books of the world's religions, Hindu Vedas, uh, the Quran, uh, the Buddhist commentaries, Confucianism, uh, Baha'i, uh, Mormonism. But finally, I did pick up a Bible. And when I did pick up the Bible, I just saw how different it was. It was the only holy book that actually encouraged objective testing. Not only challenged me to put everything to test, but showed me step by step how to put everything to test. I realized that the Bible was following the scientific method. Nine years later, I discovered why. That's where the scientific method comes from. <laughs> but after putting the Bible through uh, you know, tests over an 18 month period, I literally studied the Bible for an average of more than an hour a day over an 18 month period and recognize I could not find a single provable error or contradiction. And I found hundreds of places where it accurately predicted future scientific discoveries. And that's what persuaded me to sign my name in the back of a Gideon Bible at age 19, committing my life 
uh, to Jesus Christ. And I really want to give the Gideons credit because they are the ones that made the point that God reveals himself through two books, the book of scripture and the book of nature. And that's the mission of reasons to believe, to look at the advancing discoveries in the record of nature, to come up with more evidences that the book of scripture got everything right and is a pathway to truth. If, if you guys, how many of you have uh, read his book, The Improbable Planet? Anybody here? It's, it's interesting, right? I mean, that was uh, the level of, I mean, you gave us one little aspect tonight of just, just one little piece. I mean, the moon, the implausibility of the moon, the, the impossibility of everything we see, everything about our planet, about where we're at. I mean, good night. It just continues, I mean, it's, it is astronomical, the level of fine-tuned events. I mean, you, you can talk about this, you know, when you start talking about the fine-tuning of the earth and the uniqueness of every aspect and element. Uh, <clears throat> It just sort of shatters all, all the arguments, doesn't it? I mean, it just sort of shuts down. Well, something you see in both the book of Job and Psalms is that the more you learn from nature, the more evidence you'll uncover for the supernatural handiwork of God. And beginning with the book Improbable Planet, we're realizing that every component of the universe, Earth, and Earth's life, and every event in the history of the universe, Earth, and Earth's life plays some role in making possible the redemption of billions of human beings from their sin and evil. And I've actually been challenging my secular scientific peers to say, look, you might not believe in Christianity or the Bible, but why don't you do your scientific research from a biblical redemptive perspective and see if it doesn't make you a more successful scientist? When you, uh, when you were seeing the Bible for the first time and you were noticing that the entire book of Genesis is written from a vantage point, that was, that was fascinating to me. Can you explain that just a little bit, that, that it's from the surface, that, that it's a person standing on the surface of the earth? Sure, sure. Well, I'd been taught the scientific method in grade one, grade two, grade three. I got it throughout every one of my uh, public education years. And so when I picked up the Bible in grade 12, I began to use that scientific method. And step one is don't interpret until you establish the frame of reference or the point of view. Step two, don't interpret until you establish the starting conditions. And when you look at Genesis 1-2, it gives both. It tells you that the Spirit of God is hovering over the surface of waters of planet Earth. And then it tells you four starting conditions. It's dark on the surface of the waters. The water covers the whole surface of the Earth. The Earth is unfit for life and empty of life. And that is just confirmed when you look at the creation texts uh, that parallel uh, Genesis chapter 1. Job 38, for example, makes the point that the primordial Earth God had blanketed the earth with clouds uh, that kept the surface of the waters dark. It's dark because of, not because of the lack of light. There's plenty of light in the universe, but the early earth had an atmosphere that wouldn't let light pass through, much like the atmosphere of Venus is today. And now we astronomers know earth started off with an atmosphere 200 times thicker than what it's got right now. And that thick of an atmosphere no visible light will reach the surface. That's so fascinating, because everything fits into place when you look at it from the scientific perspective. You got questions? Yeah, Dr. Ross, first of all, thank you that you love oh, the Bible man. and love Jesus, because really smart people like yourself, it, it stirs my faith in believing the Bible when I know that a mind like yours and your team you know, really puts the Bible to the test, and then you, you come out with this vibrant faith in the Scriptures and in Jesus, so yeah. praise God for you. Uh, the questions that we always get flooded with when, when you teach is the, the age of the earth. Can you just take us again through the creation account 
and because uh, I don't think we can hear this enough, and challenge us, what are the perspectives of young versus old, and how do you come to your conclusions that the earth is not thousands of years old, but rather millions? Yeah, I'll do it from a biblical perspective. I think what's key is to realize Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. When I looked at that, I was wondering what were these heavens and the earth? Quickly reading through the rest of the Old Testament, I realized you'll never see the word universe. Biblical Hebrew does not have a word for the universe, but it's got this phrase, the Shemayen arrest, the heavens and the earth. It's used nine times in the Bible, always meaning the totality of physical reality. So in the beginning, God created the universe, and then later he forms the earth. It tells us that in the book of Isaiah. And you look at Genesis 1-1 and 1-2, you notice the way the verbs are structured and placed in the sentences. It allows for a passage of time between God creating the universe and forming the earth. And then you get into the six creation days. And what I noticed the first time I looked at it at age 17, the word day in the text has at least three distinct literal definitions because three are used on the first page. Creation day one, it's contrasting days and nights. That's day for the daylight hours. Creation day four, it's contrasting seasons, days, and years. That's day for 24 hours. And Genesis 2, 4 uses the word day to refer to the entirety of creation history. That's day as a significant passage of time. The other thing I notice at age 17 is that you have an evening and a morning bracketing the first six creation days. And again, I recognize, okay, this might be like the word day where it has literal definition, many literal definitions. And indeed, later I found out those Hebrew words for morning and evening can also mean beginning and ending and other definitions as well. But when you get to creation day seven, there is no evening morning phrase indicating that we're still in the seventh day. It's not finished yet. If it was finished, you would have an evening morning phrase. And then I found three passages in the Bible, Psalm 95, uh, John 5, and Hebrews 4, that tell us we're still in God's seventh day. So that means the seventh day, at least, is a long period of time and not 24 hours. And then you notice, too, that God creates both the human male and the human female on creation day six. But when you look at the Genesis 2 account, you've got a significant passage of time between God creating Adam and God creating Eve. Adam goes through three careers before God creates Eve. And so day six, likewise, must be a significant passage of time. And the grammatical structure of Genesis 1 uh, would indicate that all the days are significant, finite passages of time. So it's six consecutive long periods of time, and hence there is no contradiction uh, with a scientific measurement for the age of the Earth at 4.5662 billion years. One of the things that blew me away in uh, The Improbable Planet that I had no idea is that there were, there have been how many, I, I don't know whether you actually know the number on this, how many times has the Earth been what do you call it? Extinction events and re-speciation events. I, I didn't know all this stuff. I, uh, go into that a little bit. I mean, that, it, that just blew my mind, just how many well, times. Well, I hinted a little bit about that in my talk tonight. But what you'll see in Improbable Planet is that the solar system, as it orbits around the center of our galaxy, it goes through the plane of our galaxy about once every 33 million years. And when it does, it encounters uh, dense molecular clouds, which disturb the Oort cloud of comets, and then hence we get this inward bombardment. And so about once every 30 to 35 million years, Earth gets bombarded by either a big asteroid or a big comet, and that has the effect of wiping out typically half the species of life on planet Earth. Uh, but as I explained in my talk tonight, 
it's crucial that the creator remove life from planet Earth periodically and replace it with new life that's more efficient in pulling greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. That's how the creator sustains a huge abundance of life on planet Earth for those 3.8 billion years. And we humans are the beneficiaries of all that pre-existing life. That's where our limestone comes from, our marble. It's where concentrated metal ores come from. It's where coal, oil, and natural gas come from, and our topsoil. And so this is what enables us to launch civilization quickly and build up a human population in the billions where we got the technology to send the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ to all the people groups of the world in a short period of time. So, uh, just centuries, not billions of years. So, so everything, the dinosaurs were for creating petroleum, all of these things were for this little window of time when we would be here and when the gospel would be preached and we would be setting up for the new creation. That's exactly right. By coming at the end of the window of time for life on planet Earth, we have this rich treasure chest of bio deposits wow. that we can mine wow. in order to have billions of yes. people hear and respond to the gospel message. It's just, it, it really is amazing. I mean, the window where we're at in the, in the universe that we can actually look back and see, and there's no other place in the universe that would be able, we'd be able to do that. That's just staggering. It's staggering to me that you don't win every argument that you're in. <laughs> I think you do win the arguments. I think it's just that people are refusing to acknowledge the truth, the simple Plain truth. And then from a, from a relational standpoint towards God and Christianity, it, it, it reveals the father heart of God, how he, he puts everything together for this little window so that he can create a family and, 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 and have, you know, people with him and that intimate story of the father heart of God. That's, that's, that's remarkable. Well, it's just, it's incredible that before the foundation of the earth, the Lord was looking at us. He was, he was looking at this moment in history. I've just done a study on the, you know, the heart of God, and man, this just, this just exposes it. I always, my faith took a giant leap when I started listening to Hugh, because mm -hmm. it was just, I had God way, way, way too small, and you just exploded every you know, micro, image and, and understanding of God. He's so much bigger than we can imagine. So, so why did God create mosquitoes? <laughs> <laughs> well, mosquitoes do play a crucial role in the <laughs> ecosystem. I mean, if you, like, if you like trout, guess what trout eat? Yeah, they eat the larvae right. of mosquitoes. And you know, there's over 200 different species of mosquitoes. Only six of them bite human beings. Wow. Uh, mosquitoes are the only uh, uh, species of life in the Canadian Arctic that eats lemming poop. And so they're helping to recycle the lemming poop. They feed the fish, so they play a very important role in the ecosystem. But I want I you to you. realize there you this. Go. <laughs> <laughs> I you, we can't stump you, man. We just can't stump you. <laughs> oh, you guys have got to think. Point, you guys though. have got to think this weekend and come up with some better questions. All right. <laughs> I have a good question here that, that came in about evangelism and, and science, and specifically from the the, the context of having a, a scientific person who uses science, or I guess their their understanding of science has kept them from the faith. What are some what are what what do you recommend? Like what are the best on ramps to discussions or, or, or friendly challenges or resources that you have? Because I know you have a book that, that hits this as well. But what would you say to somebody that has a friend like on the atheist borderline, really into science and sees that as a contradiction of the scriptures? How do we enter into that conversation? Let them know that there's actually churches here in America that encourage questions and debate, uh, like your particular church. Uh, many atheist scientists I engage, they have a very negative view of Christianity as a place where it's just one-way communication. You hear a sermon, you put money in the plate, and you leave. 
There's no dialogue, there's no discussion, there's no debate, nowhere to ask your hard questions. And so just simply dispelling that myth saying no, uh, there are opportunities where you can seriously engage and ask these tough questions. And we welcome all your questions. And we're happy to introduce you to research scientists in your own discipline uh, that are you know, committed followers of Jesus Christ. That's one reason why we at Reasons to Believe are raising up an army of 300 evangelical research scientists in different disciplines. So when somebody says, hey, uh, I've got uh, an aeronautics engineer who has all these questions, we can introduce them to two or three aeronautic engineers uh, that are committed followers of Jesus Christ. So if you would, what, what, are, what are one of your resources? Then you, I think you just wrote a book about always engaging people. Can you just, just, just a little bit about that? Because I, I think that's a great resource for people to have. Well, the book is Always Be Ready. And uh, you know, it's really light on the science. It's basically a story of how the book of Acts continues to this day. And a basic challenge people don't believe it, saying, put it to the test. If you will simply do what Paul recommends in 1 Peter 3.15, always be prepared to give good reasons for your hope in Jesus Christ and be able to deliver those reasons with gentleness, respect, and a clear conscience, you will see God supernaturally bringing people to you to hear and respond to those good reasons. I mean, just to give you an example, I've had many opportunities on airplanes to talk to people but you know, over half of those conversations I have on airplanes are with people who have doctoral degrees in the hard sciences or doctoral degrees in theology. And you and I both know that doesn't make up over half the flying US public. God works it out. So I'm sitting beside this person. And uh, you know, the first half dozen times that happens, you think it's a coincidence. After it's happened two or 300 times, you realize this is the spirit of God at work. Wow. And I've seen God work miracles, just like you see in the book of Acts. And so I encourage every Christian, you need to put this into practice because when you see God performing these kinds of miracles in your life, it's gonna strengthen your faith and prepare you for life in the new creation. And it's really joyous to have those ongoing experiences. But I can tell you, less than 10% of people who attend church once a week have ever shared their faith with a non-Christian adult. Uh, Book of Acts, Peter says, it's supposed to be 100%. I think the reason why it's not that high, people aren't prepared. So that's mm -hmm. our mission, really to get people prepared so they won't be afraid of these encounters when God brings them to them. You know, I, I can just vouch for that. Uh, even if you're not able to articulate, uh, you know, I, when I try to say the stuff you says, it sounds ridiculously simplistic, but, uh, but just having the knowledge gives you such confidence when you're talking to people. And uh, that's why I would really encourage you to at least read a couple of his book. What, what would you say, The Fingerprint of God, which, which one would you definitively say to start with? Well, always be ready is a good one because you don't have to be a scientist right. to put it into practice. But if you're That's wanting like, the science, if you're wanting some science, what would you say? I, I would say why the universe is the way it is. Okay. It's written at a lay level right. and basically answers the primary atheist question. Why would an all-powerful, all-loving God expose us to evil and suffering? I'm going to talk about that tomorrow, but it's in why the universe is the way it is how God had literally designed the universe to be a tool in his hand to permanently eradicate evil once and for all. So, yeah, so there's so much we wanna get into, but it'll give away what, we're talking, what you're gonna talk about tomorrow. Just give us a little peek. There are recent discoveries that have shown why we're in this place of climate stability, right? And you're gonna to talk to us about that in the morning. You're gonna talk about the... Yeah, that'll be my first message. The amazing fine-tuning designs that make possible a brief period of extreme climate stability while we're in an ice age that produces extreme climate instability. I mean, we're living at a miraculous time. 
And so I want people to appreciate that, but also realize there are things we can do to extend climate stability that will not cripple the economy, it will grow the economy. There are win-win solutions out there. And God told us we're to manage planet Earth for our benefit and the benefit of all of our life. We do not have to make a choice. We can do both. This is really hopeful stuff. I mean, it's so positive. And then the second service, the, the, main, the, the big service at 11, what are you gonna be talking about? Tell us. I'm gonna be talking about the physics of suffering and basically what the New Testament tells us about how we can put the suffering God's putting us through in a way where we can really see it bringing benefit, not only to others, but to ourselves, and how that's the secret to living a joyous Christian life. Wow. <laughs> Good stuff. I was listening to him, this is years ago, he was talking to a group of science, scientists, and he said, okay, let's go away from this conference and let's think about the physics of the new creation. <laughs> <laughs> that just blew my mind. I, I don't even know how to think about that because we're talking about multidimensional stuff, right? You're talking about. Well, to me, what's most exciting about the new creation, our relationships will no longer be linear. I mean, because we're constrained to a single dimension of time that can't be stopped or reversed, I can only have one intimate relationship with a human being at a time. And that's actually crucial in order to have God eradicate evil quickly and efficiently. So currently we must be in this single dimension of time. But once evil's been eradicated, there's no longer a need to constrain us human beings to a single dimension of time. So one of the things I'm looking forward to the new creation is being able to have billions of simultaneous loving relationships. That's incredible. So Jesus, that's why Jesus can relate to each one of us. When you think of a billion people dying and, and him being alone with every one of them, but it's, it's that multi, multi-dimensional aspect of who he is. You said that the particle accelerator experiments have proven how many dimensions went into dimensions of reality are Verifiable. Well, just with respect to our physical universe, there's one dimension of time, three large dimensions of space, and six very tiny dimensions of space. And the space-time theorems tell us there's a God beyond those 10 space-time dimensions that's got the power to create space-time dimensions of will and maybe even super dimensions that are way greater in their capacity than space and time. Maybe that's why he doesn't explain the Trinity to us. <laughs> Hugh, man, we are so excited about you being here, always. Even virtually like this, it still works. Uh, so why don't you just pray for us before we go, and we're just, again, just so grateful, man. Thank you for this. Father in heaven, yes, I wanna thank you for giving us the privilege of being alive in the 21st century we have this amazing technology uh, where we can communicate uh, with one another without concern about distance. And thank you too, Lord, that this is a time when you're revealing so much to us through your book of nature. Literally every day, we're getting fresh revelation from you that increases our confidence in the book of scripture and in what you've done for us on the cross. And Father, I pray that we would take this short life we have here on earth seriously, realizing that you're preparing us for a career in the new creation that's beyond what any one of us can think or imagine. It's gonna be so fulfilling and so joyous. So Father, I pray you give each of us a motivation to live this life for your purpose and your glory and every day to receive more of your love, life, and truth. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank, thank you. you, Dr. Ross. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> okay, so tomorrow morning we're going to have two different services, 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. A couple things here that I want to just inform us of before we, we head out. Number one, we're going to be having uh, a communion 
over in the atrium chapel just after service when we dismiss. Uh, we, had, we do communion every, the first Wednesday of every month and then the weekend following. So we'll be having communion serving in the atrium chapel just next door if you'd like to stay for that. And also, if you look here on your bulletin, Reasons to Believe, we have a local chapter. They actually meet here on our campus once a week. You can see the information here. Their team, which uh, partners with Dr. Ross and his team, they're going to be out there and around the, the bookstore. There's George right back there. Lots of questions on how to interact, get their resources. They're actually giving Grace Church a 40% off on the RTB website for any of their resources as well. George, do you have a, a coupon for that? Do you have that Grace 2020 code? Okay, well, it's Grace 2020. There you go. So Grace 2020, real easy. Go to the RTB website. Grace 2020 is the code, 40% off all of the resources. So you, you want to take adva advantage of that. And I believe that's it. All right. I lost my glasses. And I was sitting up in the balcony, went down the set of stairs and around this side. So if y'all run into a set of glasses, please, they're mine. And I can't see without them. So... Right. You did well tonight, though. I had no yeah, idea. No, you did great. I was, it, it was kind of <laughs> kind of looking strange at him. All right, this is gonna be good, right? Y'all like having guys like this in? I mean, I super I just, intelligent. This just super feeds intelligent. my soul. All right, we'll see All you in right. the morning. God bless you guys. Good night.